Welcome to Pentecost today. Larry Sparks, your host, and I am so thrilled to bring on, in just a moment, a real revival general whose eyes have seen the move of God. Right now, in the 21st century, there are many people who are talking about revival, and we throw the word around. I never want to be casual with it, because when we speak of revival, there's a context. When we talk about a move of God, the context is God breaking through a heaven of brass, moving with his manifest presence and power, and coming with a visitation that I do believe has the opportunity and the potential to change the landscape. And where we are right now, I'm sure for those of you who are joining us live, or maybe you're listening after the fact, you recognize our nation, the nations, need a move of the Holy Spirit that changes the landscape. I'm talking about impacts every area of society and culture. And I believe, and I am convinced on biblical precedent, it begins with you, begins with me, begins with the church. It begins with a people who understand the key I don't think there's like 10 secrets or seven keys. I I understand that language. I'm a publisher. We use that in some of our books. But I really believe that there is a missing ingredient today in the modern church that we need to get back to in order for us to see a kind of move of God that will literally change the landscape of nations. So without further ado, I'm bringing on Pastor John Kilpatrick. He was a senior pastor of the Brownsville Assembly of God in Pensacola during the revival in 1995 to 2000, but that's not it. He became pastor of Church of His Presence in Daphne, Alabama, where they saw another powerful, dynamic outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Bay Revival or the Bay of the Holy Spirit Revival. I mean, people often say lightning doesn't strike twice. I'm going to say this. I believe the lightning of God strikes wherever there is that cry of desperation. So without further ado, I am bringing on Pastor John Kilpatrick. Thank you so much for joining me, Pastor. Thank you, Larry. Now, it's amazing because, again, I'm thinking about the Bay Revival. I remember going to some of those gatherings that you had in Orlando where you and Nathan Morris were traveling around and Lydia to different places and doing these revival gatherings. My life was deeply impacted by Mm. that, and I am so grateful. I want to ask you this question totally unscripted, (laughs) not in my notes. But, you know, you had two, I believe, significant revivals. And what happened in Brownsville, what happened at the Bay I believe that was absolutely classified as revival. What do you feel like positioned you all, your community, to experience revival twice, significant revival twice like that? Well, you know, the first time revival came to Brownsville, I I think it was out of desperation. Um, There was a desperation in my heart to get out of church as usual. I just built a new church and, you know, Everything was going great. I, I, everything was going. I mean, in my column, it was all check marks. Everything was wonderful. But even with having a new church and great victories and you know worldwide notoriety, I was absolutely just lonely and miserable. And I just didn't want to think about going into pastoring a church like that and having a big ministry. I. I it just didn't matter to me anymore. I, I was desperate for God. I, it was a desperation. And I got to where I'd get up in the middle of the night and just go drive to Brownsville and I'd let myself in through the breezeway and I'd cut the alarm system off and I'd go into the church about three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, couldn't sleep and just go in there and stretch out and just pray and cry out to God. And I, I remember telling God so many times, I said, God, I love you. I have no complaints, but I said, if I can't have you, and if I can't have your touch, I'd just soon leave the ministry and go do something secular. I'm tired of preaching what I'm not seeing. I'm tired of preaching that you can save, and I'm not seeing people saved. I'm tired of preaching that you can heal and do great and mighty things, but I'm not seeing it. And I said, I just, I'm frustrated, and I, I want to see it. And I said, I'm, I'm willing to sell out to you totally until you give what I'm looking for. And I know that you want to give it. And I want to prove to be worthy of you sending revival. And so I began preaching it to my church to the point that I'm sure it was offensive to some people. I'm sure it was. But I was I was so desperate <clears throat> that it was leaking through into my preaching. 
And so as I began to preach it and we began to pray and I called a prayer meeting every Sunday night, we prayed two and a half years every Sunday night. And then after that period of time, it broke out on Father's Day of 95. And whenever it came, it I have to say it was far superior to anything I ever imagined it to be in my mind. It was an over answer to prayer. Mm. Whenever God sent revival to Brownsville, even after praying two and a half years, I just didn't anticipate it being of that magnitude. I just never felt that you could experience the presence of God that strong and get up and walk away. I, I just, it felt like at times you were just going to perish, not, not phobic or anything like that, but just felt like you were going to perish under the weight of that glory. It was just breathtaking, breathtaking, and it was life-changing. And uh, it changed a church. It changed a pastor. It changed this nation. It changed the nations of the world, many of them. Over four and a half million people came through the doors. I think it was two things. I think it was exasperation, hmm. that we were just exasperated. You know, I was, that I wasn't seeing what I wanted to see. I was tired of religion. I was tired of preaching. I was tired of my own preaching. I was tired of worship. Yeah. I was tired of getting together with preachers and talking about nonsense. I was exasperated. And I was desperate. I was desperate for God. I, I just was so desperate. I was as desperate for God as a man in the desert with no water. That's how it was. And I just told God, I said, God, you know my heart. I can't, I can't go on like this. So when God sent revival, it was absolutely the most mind-boggling thing. But I knew, I knew as soon as it came, I knew that it wasn't going to be a one-night service. Yeah. I knew that it had built in that explosion, the dynamics of a long term, whatever it was going to be. But I didn't know it was going to be five years. And I didn't know that four and a half million people would come through those doors. But I knew that it had all the dynamics and that explosion that day that was going to change so many things, especially me. I want to ask you this question. And while I'm talking to you, for those of you who are watching, I want to encourage you in the comments if you have been impacted by Brownsville, by the Brownsville revival, we want to. I, I just want to hear because I know Pastor Kilpatrick millions, and that that is certainly not an exaggeration. I know millions came through, tens of thousands gave their lives to Jesus. I mean, I don't know if they've given or put together data and that type of information, but I know so many came to the altars and were dynamically touched. Yeah. Um, I want. I do want to ask you this though, as I was listening to you, what 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 do you think provoked or caused your desperation? I mean, did, did you find yourself reading revival history and seeing what other people in times past had experienced? Or did you just read in the scriptures what was available and then realize, you know what, we're not walking this? What, what made you desperate? Because I feel like right now in the 21st century, 2022, there is a new kind of exasperation happening. I feel it even now. And, and, and it's people with large mega churches, people with all the bells and whistles and the entertainment and the relevant preaching and all that. And I actually feel like there's a lot of those pastors and leaders who are desperate, just like you were that same cry that you cried out in the middle of the night, laying down on the pews. I feel like the Lord is really breathing on that, but what caused you, what provoked your desperation? Well, I was raised under a pastor. He was a powerful man of God. And I was raised under him, and I prayed with him every night for years, every night, seven nights a week. So I, I knew the power of God. I knew the presence of God. I knew intercessory prayer with him. I saw the results of it. I cut my teeth on it. So after I got in the ministry, I had my first church for two years. My second church, I pastored for six years. My third church for three years. Then I came to Brownsville, and I'd been at Brownsville 13 years when revival broke out. I was, I'd been there 13 years at that time. Wow. And so after having been in those places, I couldn't get away from those prayer meetings. I couldn't get away from those supernatural manifestations that I experienced as a boy. And so I heard the Lord say to me one day in prayer, I was in there praying on a Tuesday, and I heard the Lord say to me, he said, if you'll return to the God of your childhood, he said, I'll pour out my spirit in this place. And I remembered the God of my childhood. But when I started pastoring, I became busy. 
I still loved God. I still preached under the anointing. I still had great results. Even when I went to Brownsville, we was in a revival for the first several years. The church grew quickly from like a little bit less than 300 to almost 1,000, 1,100 people in just a matter of a couple of years. So we had revival then, but it wasn't anything like it was when revival came in 95. But I just remember the Lord said, if you'll go back to the God of your childhood, he said, I'll pour out my spirit in this place. So my mind went back to those days when I wasn't a pastor. My mind went back to the days when I was a teenager and I was in those prayer meetings every night and it was pure. It was holy. It was tuned in and plugged in every night to God and being under my pastor's covering and, and experiencing what God gave to him. I was under his canopy. He was my covering. And while I was under his covering, I was getting a lot of the things that God had given him. I was, I was getting the drippings of it. So now that I've been pastoring, I, I was having great success, but I had gotten away from that and I missed it. And so that's what the Lord said to me. He said, if you'll return to the God of your childhood. And I think that there's many people today that may be even pastoring churches that they miss what they were raised on. They miss the anointing. They miss prayer meetings. They miss lingering around the altar together after church service and praying and receiving the Holy Spirit and praying for people. And they miss that and they become too busy. The services are too close together. You know, we end one service at 11 o'clock. We've got to get them out of here because we've got to get other people in here by 1130. And the very things that made us Pentecostals and the things that made us charismatics has now, we got away from it. Yeah. And what we've got, we don't like. We like the Lord. We love the message. We preach the word, but we miss the things that makes revival, revival. Yeah. And that's what I think people are trying to get back to. They just don't know the way. Yeah. They don't know how to get back there. They don't know how to unplug from this receptacle and go back and plug into that receptacle. Mm. But there's power there. There's power in that receptacle. Yeah. I'm ready to unplug from religion. I'm ready to unplug from what man thinks and what man says and what some churches are espousing to be the way of church growth. I'm unplugging from it. I don't want it. Yeah. I, all, I tell you, I'm so desperate for God. I just want a move of God in my life. You can take these other things. You can have it. Go for it. Get as many people to go with you as you want to have. But I'm not going there. I'm going this way. Yeah. I'm going to plug back into the receptacle of revival and the glory of God. That's where it's at for me. Yes, yes. Well, Pastor, it's interesting because last year I was at a church that we're both familiar with at Fresh Start Church. Yeah. And Kim and Paul Owens prayed over me. And I felt like I got this impartation. I didn't quite 100% know what happened. I went back and said, Lord, what did you do to me? What, what were you releasing? And the Lord emphatically said this. He said, Larry, tell my church I'm reintroducing her to Pentecostal fire. Yeah. Pentecostal fire. Because yeah. what you're saying right now, I've heard people who are leaders in the church, who are sons and daughters, who came out of the charismatic Pentecostal movement, feeling like we need to get relevant, we need to get hip, we need yeah. to modernize, we need to go beyond. I mean, they've even used language like we don't need that Pentecostal stuff or that <laughs> Holy Spirit yeah. stuff. But I'll, I'll say this and I'll get your perspective on it. I think sometimes with good intentions, these pastors and leaders think, well, the world out there, the people who don't know Jesus, they don't want to see all that weird stuff in the church. You know, we've got to give them entertainment. We've got to give them Disneyland, Hollywood in the church. But I'm convinced, and you saw it for five years in Brownsville, I'm convinced that people who don't know Jesus, who are disconnected from God, they're actually crossing the threshold of a church. They're actually coming through our doors hoping they will see a God who rends the heavens, who tears yeah. open the heavens, comes down and moves with that old time Pentecostal fire and power. So the very thing I think the the thirsty and dry world wants, we're depriving them of. But I mean, what have you seen? I mean, you've surely seen people who don't know Jesus coming into very fiery services, yeah. meeting the Lord. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make a prediction. Come on. Things are gonna get so serious so fast that people are going to start coming to church, whether there's preaching or whether there's worship or not, they're just going to come to church 
just to be with the other saints to draw strength from each other because that's how serious things are going to get outside the walls of the church. You know, there, there will be worship and there will be preaching, but people are going to rush into the church to try to be with somebody that's full of faith and they can talk to about what's happening. It's going to be so, things are going to happen so on such a magnitude in the world and in the earth that people are going to want to be, you know, what? oh my God, let's pray together. Pray for me, let's pray together. And they're going to talk about the Lord. They're going to just want to get together and just talk about the Lord. There's going to be such things happen so fast and they're going to they have such a magnitude to them. People's going to be overwhelmed. It's going to be economic. It's going to be catastrophic. It's going to be cataclysmic. It's going to involve politics. It's going to involve uh, decisions of the Supreme Court. It's going to involve law and order. I mean, you name it. It's going to happen, and it's going to start happening so fast. And I believe, I, I really believe this. I'm just saying this. I believe that by July, a lot of this is going to start. Mm. It's going to start to the point that Christians are going to realize, oh, my goodness, between now and the end of the year, what's America going to look like? Yeah. And I believe it's going to start in July. There's going to be telltale signs beginning in July that's going to help people realize, oh, my God. What's America going to be like by December the 31st? That's how fast things are happening. And whenever I tell you that, I'm not saying that off the cuff. I'm telling you that because I've thought about it long and hard. And I've been saying things like that to some of my friends. Well, here's my question, because with that being the context and the backdrop for what we're dealing with right now, I do not believe a casual or convenient approach to God is what the hour needs. I believe that there is a kind of prayer. I mean, you talk about it. We've re-released. I think we've, in a timely manner, perhaps not even foreseeing everything that would be swirling in the atmosphere. We've re-released the book. You've made some updates. I mean, this is such a timeless book that we released back in 1998 originally yes. during the Brownsville revival. This yes. has deeply impacted me. I cited it in the book that I just wrote. So I'm very grateful for this. But I really believe in this book, When the Heavens Are as Brass, you talk about a kind of prayer. You talk about the kind of prayer, the type of approach to God that ultimately does open the heavens and connects us with that spirit of revival. And we were talking about it just before we went on. What kind of prayer, Pastor Kilpatrick, did you see leading up to Brownsville, leading up to the Bay Revival and that we need right now? What's the kind of prayer that it's going to take for us to experience revival? Well, actually, it, it was prayer, but it was more than prayer. It was obedience. Mm. What brought about this book, I was coming home one night from New Orleans my wife and I, and whenever I got back into Pensacola, I heard the Lord say to me in 1988, he said to me, he said, son, he said, the heavens are brassing over, but from New Orleans this way toward Pensacola. And he said, because the heavens are brassing over, he said, it's going to change everything in this area. But he said, if you'll preach what I give you, and I, I don't want that to sound arrogant, but he said, if you'll preach what I give you and preach it on television, on your program, he said, I'll open the heavens over Pensacola and I'll do a great thing that will become a byword among the nations. Because back then, Pensacola was known as the abortion capital of the world. Wow. That's where they had all the abortion killings and abortion murders and all of the doctors and all that kind of thing. So the Lord said, the heavens are brassing over here. But he said, if you'll preach what I give you. So God gave me this concept of brass heavens. See, when Jesus came, the earth had been 400 years without a prophet. There was no move of the Holy Spirit at all. So when Jesus came, he came into a dark world that it had no fresh word from God for 400 years. So when he came and he was baptized in the Jordan, the Bible says as soon as he was baptized that the heavens opened over him and a voice came from heaven and said, this is my son. And so a dove lit upon him, and Jesus began his ministry, and wherever Jesus went, he had such a radically different ministry than anybody had ever seen, including the rulers of Judaism. When they saw Jesus moving around and all, he had an open heaven over him. And he said, you'll see angels going on my behalf, taking things to heaven and bringing things from heaven to me. What he was saying is, I'm going to have an open heaven. I'll hear from God. 
and I'll be able to get through to God. So he demonstrated that like an Elijah would to an Elisha. Mm -hmm. He demonstrated an open heaven. So when Jesus came, things began to happen. Demons began to be stirred up. People began to be healed. The throngs began to come out to hear him because this man operated under an open heaven. And what opened the heavens over Jesus was his obedience. Disobedience closes the heavens. Obedience opens the heavens. If God's people right now would do what Chronicle says, God said, if contingent, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face. He said, I will do this. If you'll do this, I'll do this. And I think that is a current offer that's on the table right now. And God's saying, if you'll humble yourself and obey me, I'll open the heavens and I'll pour out major revival. But if you don't humble yourself, and I have found out as time has gone along in the last number of decades, it has become almost impossible for Christians to humble themselves anymore. They won't hardly humble themselves with each other anymore. A wife won't hardly humble herself before her husband. A husband won't humble himself before his wife, parents before their children, preachers before the congregation, congregations before the, the, the preacher and the staff members. It's like we have built up such a resistance to humility and humbling ourselves. And that's why the heavens are brassed over. That's why we're not having a move of God. And he said, I'll pour out my spirit. If you'll do this, I'll do this. And so I, I don't think it's so much a prayer as much as it is a walk of, dis, a, a walk of obedience. Well, and I, I'd like to finish there because as you're talking about humbling ourselves before the Lord, I think that's absolutely essential for where we are right now, because even in a congregational context in a church, that might very well, and you can tell me what you think about this, I, I do think revival is near. I think revival, I don't want to just say it like that, I think any church or any pastor leader, it's possible to experience revival, but maybe Pastor Kilpatrick, one of the reasons that we're not is that maybe on a church leadership level, we are not actually humbling ourselves before the Lord and to the Holy Spirit. And we think we know what makes the most sense. We think our church growth methods and methodologies and our sermon series and all this. And again, I'm not saying that stuff is evil. I think it becomes evil, though, when we exalt those things above what God wants mm -hmm. to do, above the move of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's one thing you do mention in this book, though, where you tell the story basically of a church that gets a new pastor, young pastor, it seems like. Sounds like a young, hip, kind of cool pastor. And there was a little, little old lady who was kind of the intercessor in that church. And she kept praying and interceding. And she was a faithful intercessor. And he basically came in and got frustrated with it and said, you know what? Mm -hmm. We don't want to do that stuff anymore, basically. No. Mm -hmm. And that concerns me. That is a lack of humility because, again, one of the things I hear sometimes is, well, we don't want to do that old school stuff. Yeah. Well, you know what? The reality is the old school stuff is what got the breakthrough. The altars, the fire, the baptism yeah. of the Holy Ghost, tarrying, yeah. grabbing yeah. the horns of the altar. I mean, people in my generation be like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about yeah. the stuff that actually got the breakthrough and we must humble ourselves to the ways of the Holy Spirit. What would you have to say about that? Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, the, the thing is, it's like there's been a great falling away. And because of that great falling away, we've fallen and we can't get up. We're not going to be able to get up on our own. It's going to take revival to get us back up. Wow. If someone's dead, they need resurrection. But if someone is in a stupor, a spiritual stupor, or they're in a spiritual coma, they need revival. At least there's life there to work with. You can resuscitate that life. But if there's no life there, you you got to have resurrection. Yeah. So I believe that there's life in our churches. I believe there's a little spark of life left in many of our churches in America. But what we need is for God to come and put his mouth over us and breathe that ruach of God back into our lungs. And revival could take place overnight in America. Revival could take place quickly. And I'm believing that that's going to happen. I'm believing it won't be just revival, but I'm believing it's going to be a great awakening. Yes. Because right now we're at a place that we're going to have to have a great awakening for it to really make the kind of difference that we need in our world right now, especially America. America right now, 
I'm just being honest with you. You know this, but America right now is in great peril to the point that I don't think the average person in America even realizes it, but it's in great peril. And it's, it's, it's something that's right at the door. And uh, I'm concerned about it. I see it coming. And the only antidote for what we're talking about is a move of God, a, a fresh move of God. Yeah. The Lord told me that there's going to come such a time that he's going to touch big cities and he's going to touch major metropolitan areas in this country that warehouses will be transformed into prayer houses. That there's going to be empty warehouses that will be reconfigured to accommodate thousands of people almost in just a matter of weeks and they'll become prayer houses. People's going to start praying. They're going to realize we've got to pray. We've got to return to God. We've got to pray. And that's what's about to happen, I do believe. I'm trusting for that anyway. But, I, I, you know, whatever whatever is coming, it's not coming anymore. It's knocking on the door. Yeah. yeah. Again, the book is When the Heavens Are Brass. I'm just going to announce that. It's available on June 21st. You can pre-order on Amazon now. You can go to John Kilpatrick's ministry, and you can yeah. order it there. Uh, the reason I wanted to say that is, Pastor, I I'd like to just close in a time of prayer, if you don't mind yeah. praying. Because as you were sharing that, I, I had this picture. And it's something I remember you and I having a conversation about this, probably probably at the Olive Garden, where we were talking about doing that book, The Fire That Never Sleeps. Mm -hmm. And we just had a wonderful conversation about revival. I remember you put this picture in my mind of what Holy Spirit will sometimes do to evaluate an atmosphere if it is fit for revival. It's like he will release a measure. To release a hovering of his presence. I even feel that now for those watching. I want to yeah. encourage you. I do sense, like you said, Pastor Kilpatrick, my heart burned when you said America can have revival. Churches in America could have revival overnight. I believe Almost it. Almost overnight, There's, yes. That, that, no, I, I believe it. I don't think that's an over-exaggeration. I think the spirit is hovering. He's brooding. And he's almost looking and evaluating, what are we doing with his presence? Yeah. What are we doing with his presence? In the same manner, Pastor, that he hovered and he brooded that day, Father's Day, 1995. I mean, you can go back, people, you can go back and watch on YouTube. That yeah. Father's Day, 1995 service. Yes. Me and my friends, Tommy and Miriam, recently sat down and we just watched it. And we just sensed that escalation as Steve was really sharing the testimony of what the Lord had done in him. And it really ignited hunger in everybody else. But as a leader there, Pastor Kilpatrick, you could have really said, all right, you know what? We're just going to kind of shut this down. It's Father's yeah. Day. Everybody's going to go and have lunch. But you made a decision as a gatekeeper there. We're, we're going to open up the gates and let the king of glory come in. Yeah. What, what would you say? Just some final words, uh, encouragement well, to pastors and leaders right now who are seeing that hovering, brooding presence of the spirit, which I, I do believe there are, are seeing multiple places across the United States. I think if I hadn't have been desperate, I probably would have shut it down. If I would have been the old John Kilpatrick and I wasn't desperate and I was happy in my church and I was, you know, trying to climb the ladder and I'm trying to do this and trying to be known, I think I would have shut revival down. But I was so desperate that whenever God started moving, I was lunging at it. I was lunging at it. I was going to grab a hold of it. I was not going to let it go. But let me, do I have time to tell one more thing? You do. Absolutely. Okay. You know, the Shunammite woman. The Bible said that, you know, God gave her a miracle son through Elisha. He said about this time next year, you'll have a son. And so the, the child was born and now he was like a teenager and he died. And they took the dead boy and they laid him on the prophet's bed, on Elisha's bed in that little room that she had made for the prophet. They laid him on his bed. And so when Elisha came in the room, there lay that boy dead. And the Bible said Elisha went over and laid on that child. He put his hands on his hands. He put his mouth on his mouth and he put his eyes on his eyes. Hands speak of the anointing. Eyes speak of vision. And the mouth speaks of prophetic. And when Elisha stretched himself out across that dead boy, the Bible said he warmed him up. He just warmed the boy's flesh up. And he got up off of him. And the Bible said Elisha walked around the room. What I believe that was is what's happening to many churches. 
I believe that the Holy Spirit is coming and He's laying on some of the churches and He's warming them up and He's getting off and He's walking around the room to see what kind of feedback He's getting. He's getting the feedback to see, do, do they like this? Do they want this? Do they want, them, do they want more? Do they not like this? Do they want me to quit? It was like Elisha walked around the room and he was, he warmed that boy's flesh up, but yet it was like the Holy Spirit warms our churches up and he begins to move in our churches and the preacher's preaching different now and he's preaching under the anointing now and people are beginning to cry and people are beginning to come to the altars and a lot of your uppity people are complaining about it. So Holy Spirit's listening. Before Holy Spirit will go any further, He listens for, do they want more or do they want me to stop? And the Bible said He came back and laid on Him a second time. Eyes on His eyes, mouth on His mouth, hands on His hands. And the Bible said this time the boy sneezed seven times. Seven in the Bible is completion. And sneezing, He was exhuming all the death out of Him. When you sneeze, you're getting rid of the cold. When this boy was started sneezing, he was getting all the death out of his system, sneezing it out of his lungs, sneezing it out of his esophagus, sneezing it, getting the oxygen going back again. He'd been dead. And he sneezed seven times. And the Bible says Elijah took the boy up. He was resurrected now from the dead. And he took the boy by the hand and handed him to his mother. And it was a, it was a miracle of revival. God resurrected that boy and it was a miracle revival. I just pray when God begins to move in America that we won't be so highfalutin and so high and mighty that when God begins to move, we start making fun of it. And we're saying, I don't want no part of that old fogey stuff. I don't want, that's old school. We've moved on. You better be careful what you say. Holy Spirit will move on down the line. When God begins to move, lunge at it, jump at it, and don't let go of it and say, God, Whatever you do, don't leave this church. Don't leave me. Sin revival, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we're just going to pray for the people, Pastor Kilpatrick. Thank you so much. I mean, goodness, I'd give you two hours to go on. I just want to be respectful of your time. Uh, Father, we thank you right now that you yes, are hovering. Lord. Oh, Pastor, as you were sharing that, I just sense that that hovering, brooding presence of the Lord. Lord for those Lord, who are Lord, watching Lord, right Lord, now, Lord, I just Lord, encourage Lord. you, even in the comments, just say, I receive, I, I say yes. Just write that I say yes. God, we say yes. We yes, say yes Lord. to the altar. We say yes to the blood of Jesus. We say yes to the cross. We say yes to the anointing and the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. We say yes to a baptism of the Holy Spirit that comes with the yes. evidence. We thank you, Lord, that you are moving, God, and we yes. will lunge. God, for every pastor and leader who's watching, I do pray, God, that their desperation would provoke them to lunge towards the move of God and give you that church. That church does not belong to them. It belongs to you, Jesus, and it belongs yes. to the Holy Spirit. So we yes. thank you for what you're doing. Uh, pastor Kilpatrick, would you mind just finish uh, pray, praying us out? Lord, put hunger in the hearts of the hearers, Lord. You said, blessed are they that hunger and thirst. Lord, we can't hunger on our own. We don't have an appetite for these things. You have to give it to us, Lord. So I'm asking you to give an insatiable hunger. Let it strike your men of God around this nation and around the world, Lord. Let such a hunger that nothing will satisfy them. Nothing will satisfy them. Nothing will slake their thirst except a fresh move of the Holy Ghost. Lord, in Jesus' name, we pray for revival. We pray for it from the north to the south and from the east to the west. All faiths, all denominations and non-denominations, all races, all colors, all creeds. Father, send revival. We know that it can happen quickly, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That's one phrase the Lord's put in my heart, unbearable hunger unbearable yeah, hunger yeah, that, like that it would provoke us. And honestly, again, I mean, I publish books. That's what we do. But my heart, Pastor Kilpatrick, when I was reading this book, the old, the old edition, 
That's what it does. I want resources and books that provoke me, say, God, I must taste and I must experience what you have made available. I'd like to encourage people to pick it up because this is this is a revised version. Yes. There's a lot of things that we've added to it. And so I'm I'm real proud of this. Yeah. I think it's a fresh touch on it. Yeah. So I'd really like to encourage them to pick up a copy. I agree. It's timely and it's timeless. So um, thank you, Pastor Kilpatrick, for your time. Thank you for this book. And thank you for your hunger that provokes and pushes us forward. I love that. I'm lunging. We're lunging for revival. We're Holy Spirit's moving. We're going to move with him. So yeah. no thank you, you, sir. And thank you all that you joined us today. And we're so grateful to have you watching the program. We encourage you to share this. I do believe that there's a real anointing on this to provoke that unbearable hunger for more. God is moving and we're very grateful for what he's doing. All right. Thanks everyone. We'll see you soon.